called the, uh, again, chapter 9. The title of the message, Two Demonic Armies Bring uh, Judgment, or as I kind of misspoke a few weeks ago when I was talking about somebody bringing peace to the, um, the Middle East, and I said peace to, to Middle Earth. Well, we're kind of Middle Earth here, you know, except there's no, not going to be any hobbits running around. It's just all those other creatures that are chasing them all over the place seem to be uh, appropriate for the description of... Uh, of what's going on here in chapter 9 is there really are two demonic armies that are, that are set free. I actually thought about bringing a, a, a little bit of the, the Lord of the Rings, <laughs> showing you the, at least the episode where the ball rock is chasing <laughs> them through that one area because that's an apt description of some of the creatures that we see here that are quite frightening. Now remember... Uh, the context is we had an angel flying in heaven in the previous chapter saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. And this is not like Eeyore saying, woe is me. This is like, whoa, the Greek word there, it's a scream. It means you should be scared to death at what's coming. And as we get to the fifth trumpet judgment, it's the first one of those woe judgments. And as we read it, you'll understand why the angel was warning people the way that, uh, uh, that he was. So again, it's Jesus that is opening the seals. And when he gets to the, and every time he opens the seal on the scroll that only he was worthy to open in heaven, the scroll can be opened and more can be read about what is going to happen in the future. And when he gets to the sixth seal, then what we read is that there are really seven trumpet judgments that come, and we're in the fifth. By the time we get to the end of the sixth trumpet judgment, which we will at the, uh, at the end of our time today, at least in chronology, we'll be at the middle point of the, of the tribulation, and then things get worse. Uh, because again, what's going on right now is we have a man that's uh, risen to prominence in the European Union. Uh, he has uh, taken over uh, and dominates that now, but he's a man of peace. He's going to win many awards for his peace that he's able to bring. He's going to be able to deal with Ahmadinejad. He's going to be able to deal with Nasrallah. He's going to be able to deal with Abbas. He's going to be able to deal with all of the major uh, Islamic players in the Middle East, and he's going to be a friend of Israel at a time when they have no friends, and he's going to allow them to rebuild their temple there in Jerusalem, as they are planning now, and it will be a time of great rejoicing that, that everything that we see on the news every night about the Middle East is finally brought uh, some semblance of, of peace. Of course, we know that it won't last. So in the middle of that peace in this world order that's taken over that offers so much promise, so much hope, hey, they even have a solution to the uh, identity crisis, and no one will be able to steal your identity because you'll be able to wear it on you in a little chip. It'll just be glorious. So many of the world problems will be solved by this, by this man. He comes on the scene like a, a good guy. But while that's going on, again, we have all of these judgments of God that are coming on the earth at that time. Now, as we get to next week, chronologically, we're at the midpoint, but John will once again, as he's done in the past, have basically a portion of where it's a parenthetical or a parenthesis in chapters 10, 11, and 12. While that's going on with the Antichrist and his world forces and his dominance, while all of these horrific judgments are being poured out upon the earth, this is what else is happening. We have these special two witnesses that come and, uh, and uh, some other very interesting things. But this takes us to the, uh, the midpoint. The fifth trumpet judgment opens, as we see here, the door of the abyss in verses 1 to 12, and tell me if this doesn't sound like the Lord of the Rings to you. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke ar arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power. As the scorpions of the earth have power, they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. 
In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots and many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months, and they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abandon, but in the Greek, his name was Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Again, in looking at Revelation at the beginning, we talked about the fact that if we're going to understand it, it's the book where you have to go back to the future. So as often as we can, when it's making reference to something in the Old Testament, we go there and see what it is and get a fuller explanation. There are other times when it is obviously, in this case, this language is is symbolic, and there's lots of similes. That's why I was emphasizing the word like in as. There was a popular writer in, in the 70s, um, if anybody ever read uh, The Late Great Planet Earth, which, in which thousands and thousands of people came to faith in Jesus Christ as a, as a result of the book. But in this portion, <laughs> at that point, Hal Lindsey, rather than looking this and seeing these as it is, as similes, said that these things were like heli- Vietnam-era helicopters that were going to you know, fire out of the front and out of the tail, and these would be the forces of the Antichrist and so forth. Uh, and again, he doesn't really think that anymore. But uh, we make a mistake when we try to take symbolic language that tells us it's a simile. It's not this, it's like this, uh, and, uh, and make it into something that's not. And uh, I think just a simple reading of this and what it says about its leader, (laughs) where they're coming from, out of the bottomless pit, uh, these are not places we don't know about. They are mentioned other places in Scripture. Uh, This is a demonic army. Let's look at the identity of their leader first. The falling star with the key to the abyss is identified, and there are several factors that are given to uh, identify him. First, he's referred to as the star, but not just the star, a star fallen from heaven to earth, but as a star, uh, he is identified with a personal pronoun, him. So he is, he is a person that we're talking about here. Secondly, uh, the star is an angel. In Revelation 1.20, the star is represented angels, and that symbolism st- uh, stays throughout the book. In verse 11, uh, he is called the angel of the bottomless pit. So this leader is a person uh, who is an angel, And then third, he's a person who is an angel who is a fallen angel, fallen from heaven to earth. And again, this is an indication of his moral failure. We're going to talk a bit about uh, uh, his fall from heaven. And what I'm alluding to is that this is Satan uh, himself. He is a a person who was an angel in heaven who has fallen in the past. he's, He's fallen in terms of a moral failure. And here in, in a Greek text, the verb is in the perfect tense. It means, it, means it, it happened in the past, but it continues to have results into the future. And we'd all say that's true. Satan's fall in the past continues to impact the, the world today and our, our lives today as, uh, as well. He is a, a fallen angel. The Bible speaks of, uh, of him as an unclean spirit or as a... Uh, and his hosts that work with him as demons. So again, Satan is an angel, an unclean spirit, morally fallen from his original state. He is the head of other demons, and it's his whole purpose to thwart the purposes of God, to come against anything that is good or noble or, or, or true uh, in, uh, in this life and in this world, and certainly against the kingdom of God. Jesus identifies him in John 8 as a liar and a murderer, and elsewhere, the Bible speaks of the devil and his angels. And is he glorified today or what? Isn't he? Satan is gl- totally glorified today in the culture that we live in. We're about ready to celebrate his favorite time of, of the year. Uh, we call it Halloween. It is the most popular 
the most emphasized holiday within the public school system. Uh, over Christmas, over Easter, even over Columbus Day. I mean, you name it, Memorial Day, Labor Day, there is no holiday in the public school system that is more money spent, more time spent, more emphasized than Halloween, where all of our kids get to dress up like Satan and like demons and like they're Dracula and vampires. What a wonderful holiday this is. Are people deceived or what? Very interesting. One of the most popular books out today for, for teenage uh, girls is a book. It's a series. Uh, we've talked about a little bit on Wednesday nights uh, but the, where the main character is a vampire. And he, he stalks this one teenage girl. Uh, he finally develops a relationship with her, and they have a wonderful relationship. This vampire, this young gal, uh, and this young gal, very popular today. Well, we've got it in t television shows as well. I don't know if you see the ads for the latest vampire show that's coming out. Yeah. Very interesting. A deceiver, a liar, the head of all evil and demons, and yet he's, he's totally glorified within, again, the lyrics of music, and, uh, uh, and, and throughout the, the media. But notice that he is a star that loses access to heaven. So he's fallen from his original state, morally. We're going to read about that in a moment. But he still has access to heaven. And certainly we see that in the, in the book of Job. Remember how the book of Job starts. God says to Satan in heaven, where he has access, Have you considered my servant Job? And of course, Satan has. He's been stalking him. He knows Job. He knows all about him. He knows about his wealth, his riches. He knows about his family. He's been watching him. He's been stalking him. And given the opportunity, he already has a plan. He already knows how to bring him down. You've blessed him beyond measure. You let me at him and, uh, and see if he worships you then. Well, you can have Adam, but only to this degree. Certainly, that's one of the things that we want to see here is that even in these demonic armies that are unleashed in the Great Tribulation, it's still under the sovereignty of God. Their power is still limited. What they can do is, uh, is limited, but it certainly will be a, a horrific time. There's uh, two passages in the Old Testament that talk about, again, this idea of Satan's fall from heaven. So I want to read one of them to you, and then we'll go to Revelation 12 where it actually happens. When is Satan finally denied access before heaven? What's he doing there? He's the accuser of the brethren, day and night, bringing accusations against you and against I. But we have a great advocate on high, Jesus Christ, who goes before us and intercedes for us. And by his blood, we are always found righteous and innocent of any of those accusations. But this is kind of what's going on in the heavenly. Sometimes we if I had a very bad day, we might say like, man, Satan was all over me today. No, he's not. He's probably in heaven making accusations against men and women and children that follow uh, Jesus Christ. But certainly he's got a demonic army or a host. Some of them are bound at this point in time, thank God, in the bottomless pit. And there's another whole host of them we're going to read about in a, in a moment that is in some place <laughs> referred to as, uh, as the Euphrates River in that, uh, that area uh, of a 200 million army, of a, a, again, a demonic army. So not all of them are out there, but certainly there's, you can watch the evening news and find out that uh, they are certainly active on, on planet Earth. All of those things that we see taking place, all of the evil and the suffering that goes on, humanity against humanity is inspired and orchestrated uh, by Satan. Well, again, it's Isaiah 14, and uh, that is one of the passages, but I want to read from uh, Ezekiel 28. Let me just kind of uh, give you a little intro to both of these, and you might want to read Isaiah 14 later. Isaiah, uh, and we'll get to it a few weeks in our study on Wednesday night, but Isaiah there uh, is talking about the king of Babylon and some of the things that are coming up, some of the things that are going to be happening. He's predicting, prophesying what's going to happen in the future, and all of a sudden he shifts gears. And he starts talking about somebody that is not literally the king of Babylon. Ezekiel does the same thing. He's talking about uh, and lamenting over the king of Tyre. There literally was a king of Tyre. Isaiah prophesied about his downfall. 
He lived on an island fortress. He predicted how a great leader, a great king would come along and actually build a siege ramp out to it and, and, uh, and his fall would come. And that did happen under Alexander the Great. That is exactly, exactly what Isaiah said happened. But again, in chapter 28, he's talking about this literal king of Tyre and then just, he just goes to another page. He just shifts gear. For example, in verse 13, he says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. King of Tyre <laughs> didn't exist from all, all the way to the garden of Eden, but, but so, another king did, and that, that is Satan uh, himself. So let's, with that in mind, let's take a look, and, and as you listen to this, you can understand, need to understand, it's talking about Satan. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, sapphire turquoise, an emerald with gold, the workmanship of your uh, tremblets and pipes, uh, again, probably instruments of worship, were prepared for you on the day you were created. You are the anointed cherub who covers I established you. Now, again, we've already had several visions of God's throne. We've made reference to the fact of Isaiah's visions and the seraph, a type of angel, seraphim, plural, and now the cherub or cheraphim that are around the throne, the four living creatures. We talked about when they begin to turn to God and worship God, that all heaven kind of breaks out in worship. So they're orchestrating, they're directing, and apparently at this time, this time in the past, before his moral fall, Satan was right, right there. You know, he was a unique uh, being. And again, we'll see, and Isaiah says, his pride had everything to do with his fall. God says, I'm the one that established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. So as this, this has not happened yet, it's going to happen in the tribulation. We'll read about it in a moment. He goes on, And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the in uh, inquiry of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. That's in the future. It hasn't happened yet. But there's the fall of Satan, very parallel to what Isaiah says in Isaiah 14. He was cast out because iniquity was found in him. Your heart was filled up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Uh, and again, so here's Satan, uh, the king of the bottomless pit. But notice, he can't open the pit unless he's given a key. And he can't get the key unless God gives it to him. And even when he gives it to him, he says, here are your parameters. You can only do this. Do this no more. God is still sovereign, even though Satan has fallen and come to planet Earth. He's got access to, in a sense, our hearts and minds and tries to tempt us and lead us uh, astray. But God is still sovereign over, over his uh, limited access. Turn over to Revelation 12, and then we'll, we'll see the actual when he's finally uh, cast down. And again, sometimes we mis, uh, misunderstand this, but but uh, Satan has access now, but there's going to come a time in the future when he no longer has access to heaven. It happens in the Great Tribulation, uh, in the middle of the Great Tribulation. And we see it in Revelation 12, 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, which is just another word for Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. 
So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But notice here's another woe. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. He's got three and a half years. It, unless he can reverse things unless he can completely destroy every Jewish person on the, on the face of the earth. Because if he can do that, he can prevent them from crying out to the Messiah, which brings Jesus back to planet earth to set up his kingdom. He's been trying to destroy them for a long time because he's read the end of the story. He knows the end of the book. And, uh, and again, the, the Antichrist will be used by him for that purpose, coming on as the friend of Israel, but halfway through the tribulation at this point in time becomes the all-out persecutor of Israel, and two-thirds of the Jews on the planet Earth will be killed during that, that Holocaust. But a third will remain and be protected by God as a remnant in what we call Basra or Petra in, uh, in modern-day uh, Jordan, where God will supernaturally protect him to the end until they cry out and, and weep for him who weeps for our only son uh, and so forth. It cries out for those, uh, the, uh, the one in whom they have pierced. Let's go back to this idea of the, the star is a person, the star is an angel, the star is a fallen angel, and the star loses access to, uh, to heaven. It's important to see this and always a reminder that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You may think that uh, uh, you wrestle against your husband or wife or your boss or uh, a political leader that has uh, different values that, that you do. Uh, but, uh, and we can be upset at them, but the bottom line is that Satan is the one orchestrating all of these things, not that we shouldn't be involved in, uh, in the political process and those kinds of things, uh, doing what we can to uphold truth and goodness and morality and righteousness uh, uh, at the workplace and in our home, but the bottom line is the way we engage the enemy is through prayer and through putting on the full armor of God. Uh, it's something that someone else can do for us to help us, but it's certainly something we need to do for ourselves and individually as, uh, as well. Now, I want to, I don't realize I'm spending a bit of time on this, but I want to go to one more passage in Luke 12, and I've got it for you, excuse me, Luke 10, because uh, there Jesus speaks of the importance of this as well. He is just, in a sense, trained and sent out 70 of his disciples. They've gone out and he's given them authority uh, to heal the sick and do all the things that they needed to do to be able to proclaim the kingdom of God is here and the Messiah is here. And they've gone out and done that uh, and they've been able to cast out demons. They've been able to heal the sick. You remember, and then they come back and they're, they're, they're a little bit pumped <laughs> about uh, what has transpired in their lives, as we can be as well when we see God use us uh, and use our lives, answer our prayers and and have an impact for the kingdom of God. But we'll notice what Jesus says uh, to them in regards to this whole idea of their excitement and Satan's fall. Uh, Luke 10, 17. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on, on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Here Jesus reveals the history as well as the destiny of Satan. Uh, and uh, and he, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And really, that's the whole story of, of Satan, where he's going, what's going to happen to him. That's his destiny, and this is your destiny. Your names are written in heaven. Don't get those two things confused. There's tremendous evil in the world. Things don't always go our way, it, it appears. But at the same time, remember what his destiny is and remember what your destiny is as well. And certainly, I think that's probably why 
why John says if you read the book of Revelation, it's a blessing uh, to, to read it because we realize the outcome, the final destiny, who wins. And certainly it's one of those things that we need to uh, keep at the forefront of our thinking on, on a regular basis. Do not rejoice in personal success or ministry opportunities. Jesus says, rejoice that you have a relationship with me, that you can come to me, that uh, you're my child, that I'm only a, a prayer away, that you're going to spend all eternity uh, with me. James Simpson, who is the uh, who was the one that discovered chloroform, as, long, as well as many other things, was asked one time by a reporter, what is the greatest discovery in your life? And he says, the greatest discovery in my life is that Jesus Christ is my Savior. <laughs> I love it when people give that answer. You know, whether it's an athlete or a scientist or whoever it, uh, it might be, that is the greatest thing, Jesus said. You can rejoice over a lot of things, but the greatest thing is that our names are written in heaven. The writer of Hebrews says, you've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, and we will, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written uh, in, in heaven. So remembering who our struggle is against and the weapons that we need to fight with, our destiny as well as the destiny of, uh, of the enemy. Now, now that we know who that angel is, let's go on. In the second part of this, the angel is given a key to the abyss. Uh, so again, this is clearly indicates the power and the authority is limited. It's coming from God himself. Uh, the key is for the bottomless pit or the uh, abyss. Luke 16 says it's a place of torment. 2 Peter 2.4 says, God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, delivered in them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So the Bible has already told us about the pit, about the bottomless pit, about the abyss. Uh, remember that uh, when Jesus was uh, up there in the, uh, the northern uh, Galilee area, uh, he came across someone who was demon-possessed and engaged in conversation, uh, the demons who said, uh, my name is Legion, for we are many. And they already knew who Jesus was. You are the, the son of the living one. They, they knew who he was exactly. And what were they, they, they pleading for? Don't send us into the abyss, into the bottomless pit. And um, I don't know why he didn't, but he, he remember, he cast them out and, uh, into the herd of pigs, and they, uh, they run over the, the cliff. Seems like there would have been an easier way of making deviled ham, but he, uh, he did it anyway. But it could have been to destroy uh, an uh, industry there that was illegal, and, and Jews should have not had anything to do with it as well. That should have, you know, the idea of pork shouldn't have been there. Uh, there could have been, he could have had his reasons and so forth, but nonetheless, they knew about this. They knew others were already there, and they were very afraid of going there. That's where these demons are, are coming from. The demons, uh, once he comes out of the abyss like locusts. Now, again, uh, the pit of the abyss, uh, John states that uh, in the millennial kingdom of God, this is where Satan will be held for a thousand years as well. This is not Gehenna, the lake of fire, where he will be cast and Ezekiel said, made like ashes in terms of the uh, future. That's his final prison. Also very interesting that <clears throat> the Antichrist, chapter 11 and uh, chapter 17, this man, now we, we know his earthly rise to power is described by Daniel and how that will come about. Uh, but at the same time, those, those uh, verses here in, in Revelation make a reference to him who will ascend out of the pit which lead at least more than a few commentators believe that he's basically possessed at that place. So he's this guy, maybe all altruistic values. He's trying to bring peace to the world and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, at some point in time, very much likely uh, he's possessed himself. At least he is absolutely under the control of, uh, of Satan and everything that he, that he does and says from, from a point uh, uh, in the future. The... Uh, and again, uh, here's this uh, plague of locusts, and one of the reasons that um, we don't... Does anybody think this is a, a bunch of little locusts running around here? I don't think so. They come out of a bottomless pit. Again, we don't take that literally. It's symbolic, but apparently they're going to devour like, uh, like locusts do. Uh, but again, 
They, the demons from the uh, abyss will be limited in their destruction. They cannot harm the grass, the green things, or any trees. They cannot harm the men who have the seal of God on them. If you're, uh, if you're uh, keeping track, we've already had a plague that seems, that seems to have already destroyed all the grass on the earth. So if so, is that a contradiction here? No, if you go back, you'll look that after the famine, the indication the grass that's destroyed is that which is pale, pale in color. You know, just like, you know, in places in California in the summertime, everything dries up. That grass has already been destroyed. Uh, but now that which is green still, he's saying, don't destroy that. So he's limiting what they can do. No real contradiction there. In terms of not harming the men with the seal of God on them, we talked about the 144,000 Jews that come to faith in Jesus as a Messiah. They are sealed and they are sent out. We believe there's a cause and effect with the tribulation martyrs we saw in heaven rejoicing and those that are sent out. So we believe that they are the ones that are out preaching the gospel to every tribe, <laughs> language, people, and nation. So uh, God's going to apparently gift them in such a way. And we talked about the fact that because of a passage in 2 Thessalonians, at least it's my personal opinion, that the people that are hearing the gospel are the people that have never heard it before. And there's a worldwide revival going on. You've got the Antichrist rising to power. You've got all these horrific judgments going on. You've got these 144,000 Jewish believers going out preaching the gospel. You've got a world. So there's, wide, there's a lot of things going on that are very parallel to each other that are happening simultaneously. Uh, and in the midst of that, again, we've got the fifth and the sixth trumpet judgments here. Uh, the other thing about the, uh, the demons or these locusts from the abyss, they're described and uh, again, John's trying to use language that he would be familiar with. He's very specific, but notice it's all uh, similes, crowns like gold. They're not gold, they're like gold. Faces like men, hair like women's, teeth like lions, breastplates like uh, iron, wings like the sound of chariots, and many horses, tails like scorpions. Sounds like Middle Earth to me. And uh, each case, again, there's a comparison being made. Crowns like gold may just indicate that they are conquerors when they go out. Breastplates uh, may indicate the fact that they are immune from destruction. Again, uh, this is not good news for the Antichrist. He's trying to run the show. He's probably trying to destroy them as well, but they are immune and they are able to go out in destruction. Uh, the demons from the abyss have a king, as we mentioned. His names are mentioned here in Hebrew and Greek, and both of them mean the destroyer. So... A horrific time, limited by God. That's the, the fifth trumpet judgment. The sixth one, by the way, it gets worse. The sixth trumpet opens the way for a, another massive uh, demon army. Look at verse 13 to 21. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses and the visions. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. So this is a whole, a whole different army here. Uh, again, of fallen angels who uh, they actually released them. Uh, but again, under God's control, limiting their ability to oppress mankind. John hears a voice from the uh, throne of God, so we know it's with God's full authority uh, that these orders are given. And again, all of these, sang, these things that are, that are bound, there's no holy angels that are bound. It's only demonic angels. Why the river Euphrates? Uh, a couple of different views. One is certainly the fact that uh, it's mentioned in the Garden of Eden. So that's where it all began. You know, if there's going to be a holding place, uh, that's where sin entered the world at the Garden of Eden, and it could be in, uh, in that location there, since it was the place of Satan's original deception. Uh, 
another view is the rivers Euphrates is, is in connection with Babylon, which is in symbolically represents Babylon the Great and false religious systems and so forth. And, and uh, in, in antiquity, the river Euphrates was the dividing line from east to west. But either way, it's, uh, it's there at the Euphrates River. I don't know if that makes anyone nervous if they're sleeping near it or, or anything. Uh, but, uh, you know, you hear all these stories of people listening to the, trying to penetrate to the center of the earth. There was a good uh, uh, internet story going around a few years ago. Scientists were working and, uh, you, know, you know, burrowing down into the earth and, you know, looking for oil or something. And they could hear, hear screams and screams of people and so forth. It was all made up. But uh, uh, nonetheless, the, uh, that's the location. And this demonic army is numbered and described. If, if it had said in the Greek, which it says 10,000 times 10,000, if it had said that, uh, then we would know, oh, it's just an unlimited. It's just this huge number. We, we, it's uh, beyond counting. But the fact that it says 10,000 times 10,000 times 2, that means it's a literal number. It's, it's 200 million. And, uh, and it, they have horses that resemble lions. Uh, these things that come out of their mouth is what does the, the destruction. And the de demonic army will have a specific mission to kill a third of, of mankind. They're able to accomplish it through the, quote, plagues that come out of their mouths. So, again, there's a couple of different views. One is says, well, this is the same demonic army we just read about, but just uh, more destruction. But, again, we've got two completely different incidents, and uh, we have the king or Satan over them. We have four fallen angels that release these. Uh, I don't think they really have, I think they're back to back. One's the fifth uh, judgment, one is the sixth judgment. Uh, again, uh, back in a day in the, in the 70s and 80s, uh, when prophecy was really taking off because Israel was back in the land in 48, they took over uh, Jerusalem as a, uh, their own capital in the uh, 67 war and so forth. People were writing a lot of books and discussing. And right about that time, then China announced that they had a standing army of 200 million. People went, that's it. It's the Chinese. Let me ask you, does that sound like a bunch of Chinese guys on horses to you? I don't think so. But uh, so I, I don't think it's literal. I think it's a literal demonic army that, that does, in a sense, uh, God's bidding under his, his discretion. Supernatural attack of these beings. Let's go on to the third thing. The demonic activities that bring these judgments continue. What brought them continue. The people sin and worshiping demonic entities. Now they're attacked by them, but they, they, can, they continue in it. I don't know if you've ever watched somebody be destroyed by their sin. They even realize what's going on, but they just continue, continue in it. It, it could be a, a sexual relationship destroying them and their family. It could be drugs. It could be a number of things. It's amazing. They recognize that it's bringing destruction, and they just continue in it. But this is... A, Certainly big time here. Look at verse 20 and 21. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the work of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murderers or of their sorceries or their sexual immorality or thefts or their thefts. Uh, it's been said at one point in time that uh, man is a God maker because you can either choose and come to the revelation that there is one true God who's the God of uh, heaven and earth, who is the creator. Uh, and then uh, and certainly from that, uh, uh, you, that acknowledgement, you can come to the understand that uh, you can know him and have your sins forgiven through his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and, and that's it. And everything else is a, a, a false religious system. And when you enter into the realm of a false religious system and you worship, the Bible's very clear when you do that, you're worshiping demons. And it's a, a whole other area. Uh, you say, are you saying that everybody's in one of these other religious systems are worshiping demons? No, I don't think most of them are because I don't think most of them are very devout. I don't think they're really into it that much. They were born into it. It's a traditional thing. If you're born in India, hey, I'm a Hindu. Which God do you worship? Uh, the one helps make more money. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, if you're raised in Japan, you're, 
your, um, they're, they're uh, very interesting. They're born Buddhist, uh, they say, and then they're, they live as a Shinto, because Buddhism really is just a philosophy. He's not really offering any help there. But if you go down to the Shinto temple and you pay those guys money, they'll, they'll intercede and pray for you to help your business prosper and so forth. So they live as a Shinto, because they, they want some practical help out of this thing. But Shintoism only helps in this life. It offers no afterlife. So when they die, they die Buddhist because Buddhist, Buddhism, where, again, Buddha took from his, his own uh, religious background of Hinduism and <coughs> borrowed uh, this idea of reincarnation. Uh, and so it teaches reincarnation. So they got a shot at coming back again. So they're born Buddhist. They live Shinto, and then they, <laughs> they want to die uh, Buddhist at, at the end. Uh, and people go through their traditions. But the people that are into it, that are really sincere, they're worshiping demons. And that's been Satan's thing right from the beginning. And if you read the passage in, in, uh, in particular of Isaiah 14, you'll see that that's what it's all about. He was lifted up. He wanted to be God. He wanted to be God himself and to be worshiped. And that's why he fell morally. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 19. What, I, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. Please understand that term Gentile or nations, it's, it's people that don't know God. Because up until that time, you had to have come out of a Jewish tradition to know the one true God and been grafted into that tradition. Again, after all, Christianity is Jewish. Very important uh, point to understand if, again, if you're witnessing to somebody that's in one of these other religions, they'll say to you, possibly, if they're Buddhist or Hindu, that, hey, Christianity is kind of the Johnny-come-lately of religions. And you say, no, no, no. Christianity came out of Judaism, goes all the way to the time of Abraham. My religion way outdates yours. It goes back at least 2000 BC. Uh, anyway, just a side point in terms of uh, worshiping. If, so this idea of the Gentiles that he uses here is anybody that's not following that Judeo-Christian you know, thinking in terms of uh, worship. He says, which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. Should you have anything to do with an idol or idol worship at all as a believer? And Paul says, absolutely not. If in here in Hawaii, there's a lot of folks that, are, that have family, they've come to faith in Christ, their family are Buddhists, and there's a funeral. One of the things they're supposed to do during that funeral is go forward and burn incense along with, with everybody else. And Paul says, don't do it. If you do, you'll be worshiping a, a, a demon. Uh, he says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Satan's always wanted to be worshipped. Man, in, by his very fallen nature, has a tendency to be a God maker. And, uh, and we're going to see that during the tribulation period, it will be a very religious time. It will be a very religious time. There'll be lots of temples, lots of things, lots of activities. The church is gone the gospel is going out. There's a worldwide revival, but those guys are being persecuted. But everybody else that is sincerely worshiping somebody else is actually worshiping a, a demon. And, it, and it's true today as well. Listen to what Warren Wordsby says about this, this time period in history. He says, quote, Here are dead sinners worshiping dead gods. Their gods will not be able to protect or deliver them. Yet these people will continue to reject the true God and worship Satan in idols. So this will be going on. It's going on today. It'll be going on in the future. Second thing about this time is that these demonic activities include drug use. The word translated sorcery is a Greek word, pharmakia, which means the use of drugs. And, uh, and if you don't know, it's, it's used a lot in terms of a false religious system. I was, uh, <clears throat> I've mentioned going to Kali's Temple in uh, Calcutta before and uh, to see the, the blood sacrifices that were taking place in that uh, Hindu temple. Very, very big 
uh, temple there, a uh, very evil god. Kali is a very evil god. And uh, many of the Hindu gods, pe people are afraid of them. There's a reason that they throw their babies into the Ganges as sacrifices, and they're afraid uh, of these gods. And, uh, and we were in there doing a tourist thing and probably getting all kind of demons ticked off that we were in there and walking through and praying and stuff. And I told you the story. We had took 30 minutes to talk to the Indian pastors and they even going into, into the place uh, with us because they'd come out of that background as uh, Hindus. But anyway, I was amazed. It's like I'm, I'm, watching, I'm watching, you know, there's different areas of this temple and I'm, I'm asking one of them, I, I think I know what those guys are doing, but what are those guys doing over there? Oh, they're, they're uh, smoking a hallucinogenic drug. I said, yeah, it's called hash. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, I read it about once in a book. And uh, I knew exactly what they, were do what they were doing. And it's like, what are those guys doing over there? They're drinking shots of whiskey. It wasn't Jack Daniels, but I mean, that, that's what they were doing. This is all part of the, in front of an altar worshiping. Uh, and that's typical. Uh, and that's going to continue in the future. Which, which, which leads me to say this. People that are involved in the use of drugs uh, are, are buying right into a demonic spirituality, and that's why it's so hard for them to get free of those things apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why there's a, a lot of drug rehabs around, sincere people doing very good things. We know, we know all we can get but they're limited in their effectiveness if they're not Christ-based because it's Jesus Christ that sets you free from demons in a demon reality that comes along with the use of drugs and it's killing us and our families and our culture. And I just saw one recent survey. We're number two in the, in the nation as far as meth use and we're not exactly the biggest state around, which means proportionally it's, it's very, very bad here in the islands. We need to pray against it. You know, I mean, if you know somebody addicted to drugs, you need to be praying for them. But even, even if you don't know somebody, you can pray against that demonic reality that has captured the hearts and the minds and are controlling people's lives. Very, uh, very addictive. I've, I've had people walk in my uh, office. Remember when it was upstairs here? Uh, and just say, um, hey, Pastor, I just want to talk to you for a few minutes. And... Uh, you know, I know your testimony a little bit, and I've heard you on the radio on different things, and I, I just wanted to tell you that, uh, uh, you know, I, I wasn't really wasn't a Christian or anything, but I was kind of a, you know, basic guy. I was married. I had three kids, you know, kind of just living the normal life here in Hawaii, and, and, and I was out drinking with some guys, and one time, one time I did meth, and I was completely addicted. I, I emptied my bank account. I sold everything. I began to steal. My life has been ruined. I just got out of prison. I went, was able to go th get into a rehab thing. And <clears throat> I found, the Lord found me and saved me by his grace. Please tell people when you ever have the opportunity, one time is enough to completely addict a person. They're trying to get that message out. I don't know if you've seen some of the ads on TV. I think they're scary, which it should be. Uh, it's a horrific thing. These things that are affecting us now are going to get worse uh, in the future. The ground is being laid for, for so many of these things. Uh, these demonic activities include drug use. Also, these demonic activities include immorality, murderers, as violent crime continues to get worse and is actually um, portrayed uh, in movies and televisions like uh, at no other time in our, our history. Sexual immorality, and again, no sin captures and destroys and controls a person's life like a sexual addiction, whether it's on the internet or actually uh, engaging uh, out there. And then thefts. Thefts have gotten so bad that police talk about serious theft versus harmless or petty theft. They don't even pursue the petty theft. They have to go after the more serious crime. I, you know, again, as I you know, go through these, uh, these messages and whose idea was this to study this? That's what I want to know. But uh, th these are tough, tough things to, to study through, to, uh, to read through. And it's always a bit of a struggle to bring some kind of application, you know, at the end to where we're at. And, uh, and a lot of what we've seen so far is I think the Lord showing us there's, there should be an urgency, you know, about our lives and who we are and sharing the gospel and so forth. Uh, there's got to be... Um, 
an increase from wherever we're at now to where we pray more, we pray more diligently, more planned, more purposeful, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but I, I, uh, I think in this whole idea of, of the, the demonic realm, to realize again that even that is absolutely under God's sovereignty and under God's, God's control. And, uh, and therefore, we can be aware of it, but it's not something we're really concerned about or fearful about in terms of our own lives and our, our families and so forth. That's who we battle against. Uh, and when we pray, they shake in, in, in their boots. It's, it's, not the other, it's not the other way around. I want to kind of il- illustrate it um, and then uh, tell another, another, another story to maybe kind of bring this home a little bit. I was reading about the uh, uh, Golden Gate Bridge and kind of grew up for a while near it and been over it many times. Again, it's the bridge that goes from San Francisco over to Marin County. And when it was built back in the 30s, it was uh, quite an engineering and uh, structural feat. Uh, it was during the Depression, so they didn't have trouble getting guys to sign up because it was, it was good money and there were a lot of guys out of work. They called it dancing with death because of the winds and the weather and, and working on, on the, the tops of this thing. Uh, when, the, when the engineers planned the thing, they, they figured, they estimated there, there would be a, a, a number of deaths that would, uh, would occur they said for every million dollars spent, at least one person would die uh, trying to build the bridge. There was no OSHA in those days, so they came out with things like hard hats. Uh, you know, which they didn't really have on construction sites before then, and uh, and put safety lines on people. Which guys working on high-rise buildings didn't didn't always do that. You know, back in the day, they just kind of ran around up there on those steel beams. They did a number of things to try to reduce uh, the threat of. Uh, of uh, injury and loss of life. Uh, but one of the things they finally came up with was really ingenious. They thought about a, a, a circus and a, a, the high wire act or the trapeze and a net. So they stretched a net, a huge net under this, uh, uh, under this thing. Uh, and after four years of construction and $20 million spent, only, only one worker had died because of the safety net. The local papers actually carried a box score of how many guys hit the net, right? And, uh, and their lives were, were saved as a, as a result of it. But one of the things that they didn't really uh, calculate into it is that when they put all these safety measures in play, in the safety net in particular, is that the pro- t- uh, productivity of the work went way up because the guys weren't so scared to death. I mean, some of them, they were just, the wind would blow. They were just paralyzed uh, on the top of these riggings, and you wouldn't blame them. But with the safety net there, everybody was like a little more, they were less afraid. So they, they could just work better. And I think that's the, the application for us. Uh, we have a safety net called Jesus Christ. And our names are, are written in heaven. And we know the destiny of Satan, but we also know our destiny as well. It should free us up to be more productive in our, in our work uh, for, for the kingdom of God. Even with the safety net, it doesn't mean that tragedy won't ever come our way, difficult won't ever come our way. But Jesus said, I'll never leave you, I'll, I'll never forsake you. He'll go through us in, uh, in all of these things. And that he'll work all things together for good. 